This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash cinemacartography. Si je dis, euh, vous qui faites du cinéma, qu'est-ce que vous faites Je dirais, vous, ce que vous inventez, c'est pas des concepts, c'est pas votre affaire. Ce que vous inventez, c'est ce qu'on pourrait appeler des blocs de mouvement durée. Remarquez, il euh, n'y a pas question d'invoquer une histoire ou de la récuser. Tout a une histoire. La philosophie aussi raconte des histoires. Elle raconte des histoires et des concepts. Le cinéma, je pense, mettons, supposons qu'il raconte euh, des histoires avec des blocs de mouvement duré. After the ideas come, to get this thing built, all the elements to feel correct, the whole to feel correct, in this beautiful language called cinema. And the second it's finished, people want you to change it back into words. Cinema is the ultimate pervert art. It doesn't give you what you desire. It tells you how to desire. Take one. Take one? More, more, more than one take, will I? Shoot. Mr. Ford, you made a picture called Three Bad Men, which was a large-scale Western, and you had a quite elaborate land rush in it. Mm -hmm. How did you shoot that? With a camera. <laughs> we enjoy categorizations. We like to know how things are supposed to be done. We like when large-scale systems have specific rules to indicate one method of being right and the other as being wrong. These practices help us to not be caught in the unknown, especially when dealing with abstract realms of things like cinema. Now cinema is just one form of storytelling, but with an unlimited array of voices and perspectives, there's potential for the medium as a whole to become unfocused and stray further from its original tenets of creation. Without some structure, we're left with a hollow remnant of what once was the cinematic art form. But it was the very nature of the creators and those passionate about film that helped establish what exactly was it that made something cinematic. What was it that distinguished this art form from the other visual arts? At cinema's infancy, the boundary between what was and what was not cinema was much more obscured. The visual medium was still a technology being birthed and its projection, its use of photography, made it very primitive, almost indistinguishable from previous technologies such as the Magic Lantern. But within the first 20 or so years, cinema managed to craft a lane for itself. Narrative features were made, and there were names and ideas that became completely associated with the strengthening idea of cinema. Eventually, there became such a thing as film that, allowing space for a degree of exploration within art exclusive to cinema. Up to around 1920, the film theory landscape had its contributors, with the likes of Abel Gantz and Ricciotto Canudo. Yet these were still isolated pockets. Never had there been a structure, the cinematic theory to be expanded upon. A school of thought in which specific rules could be established to further the art form, with theories that could be put into practice that would become the bedrock for all of cinema moving forward. Until this building was erected. This building was the Gerasimov Institute of Cinematography, or VGIK, and it was the world's first film school. And it was here that perhaps the most important collective in cinematic theory gathered to establish the major principle of Soviet montage theory. VGIK was established in 1919, shortly after the Soviet Revolution, and was founded under the authorization of Vladimir Lenin, whose primary motive for establishing the school came with his own personal fascination with cinema. Lenin saw the power that cinema held in its ability to spread a message, and saw that one of the benefits of the medium would be to bolster and homogenize the Soviet ideals through widespread propaganda. This boiling pot of circumstances is vital to understand exactly how a foundation was laid for film theorists to establishing this instigating piece of film theory. First, there was the ideological component of the Bolshevik Revolution. Russia had just moved from a primarily peasant state under a 300-year-old Tsarist rule to the world's first bastion of socialism. The complete shift within society meant that structures and ideals had to be re-established. 
perspectives on art being one of them. The consensus now was that all art should service the greater Soviet purpose. If you watch a Soviet film from the 1920s onwards, it required permission from the state to be released and odds are, it depicted the great and courageous leap the Soviets had made. So we have a school created by the Communist Party, have supporters of that party working within close proximity to one another, and all working towards the same goal in the same field of study for the first time. This gave these artists not only the encouragement to expand upon their ideas with one another, but their fundamental beliefs all somewhat aligned with one another. So what exactly was the result of this collaborative work? Well, the Soviet theorists first aimed to find what it was that differentiated their field from the other visual arts, and then hone in on those specifics to find an intellectual manner of discourse surrounding them. They found that the one tool deemed the most exclusive to cinema was time. And how can one utilize time through cinema? Editing. And so much of the Soviet work was about breaking down the editing process to its most formalistic and precise facets. By the time we chronologically reached the Soviet school, certain practices had begun to become industry standard as cinema was becoming more of an industry. Films such as Fire by James Williamson instigated a shift in the linguistics of editing the one piece of film could be placed next to another and the spatial connection in between would be filled in by the audience. We could move from one scene to another seamlessly. Before we knew it, we were moving from indoors to outdoors. Edwin S. Porter creates the great train robbery and the stems of continuity editing are fully fledged to form sweeping narratives, able to take us to the moon and back. By the mid 1910s, D.W. Griffith had perfected continuity editing on the grandest scales possible, with his two seminal epics, Birth of a Nation and Intolerance. The former able to cut back and forth between overlapping stories occurring at the same time, while the latter able to cut between four narratives occurring at completely different eras in human history, finding thematic connections through his editing. Remember, it was only a few years prior that films were primarily made of one shot, now, cinema could manage any change in time and space, and the basic structure of how to put together a narrative with moving images has remained relatively unchanged to this day. The thing is, most of the philosophers and theorists within cinema wanted to find ways to delve into the complex intricacies offered by this art. By this period, literacy was not an issue in people's ability to read a piece of art, Literature had just as complex narratives that cinema was professing, and people had no trouble dissecting artists of that form, whether it was Dickens or Dostoevsky. However, visual literacy was a burgeoning new form. Even those making films were unaware exactly of its capabilities, until Soviet cinema elected to move away from continuity editing to a form of editing that prioritised the philosophical, aesthetic and political. Filmmaker Lev Kuleshov, and the Kuleshov effect is where the fundamental idea of Soviet montage theory begins. The Kuleshov effect was an experiment to measure the psychological reaction of viewers when confronted with specific pieces of footage. Various scenarios, ranging from a dead child to a bowl of soup, were displayed and intercut with a reaction shot, showing hunger, sadness, etc. Upon initial viewings, Audiences were reported to comment on the actor's performance and his range of emotion. However, the reaction shot was the same piece of film each time. The actor was Ivan Mozykin, and his reaction was neutral. It was only through the act of montage that it was given meaning through its contextualization. This is the primary basis of montage theory. The juxtaposition of two ideas next to one another and how they change based on their presentation. A piece of film that shows a man angry can convey the emotion, but when edited next to the thing he's angry at, the fundamental idea of the footage can change.
Very often, film was seen as the expansion of theatre, viewed as its replacement, although this can be quite reductive. To understand montage theory, let's examine a form of theatre critical in understanding the Soviet perspective of cinema, Kabuki theatre. Now, Kabuki in particular became a point of reference in the development of Soviet film theory. The preeminent writer of the Soviet school of thought was Sergei Eisenstein, and his essays remain the most fundamental in understanding the movement of Soviet montage. For Eisenstein, a kabuki play presents itself as an extrapolation from reality, with each new input a substitute for the real. Every element of kabuki is a signifier for something else. The face paint establishes a character as an archetype, and the omnipresence of a face paint means that that character is unchanging. The expressions of an instrument such as the shamisen signifies the movement of a character rather than the physical act. Internal emotion is only expressed through outward motion. Things that were not supposed to represent something, in turn, became the absolute signifier for that thing. Kabuki utilised the plasticity of its art to establish codes within its language, and this is exactly what was mirrored in Soviet montage theory. Eisenstein described in his collection of essays that a combination of elements in other art forms was simpler to combine without deeming it a disruption. For example, a musician can use three separate notes at once to make a chord. A painter can mix two hues of paint to create a new colour. So what was this equivalent in cinema? In aiming to find some manner of combining cinema's smaller elements to create something larger, it was deemed that the simplest measurement of the film language is the shot. So why should three instances of shots be seen as three separate collisions rather than a singular combination? And this is where we return to Kabuki. Kabuki exemplified the concept of gestures, and a shot became cinema's gesture, acting as a signifier. In cinema, every individual shot needed to be treated as a synecdoche. A single shot was a symbol that suggested something greater than the sum of its parts. One thing isolated on their own represents something, and upon its re-emergence, the viewer would recognise that. Like the face paint that represents a character in Kabuki. An example we could use within modern cinema is the colour red in Schindler's List. Its appearance immediately associated with destroyed innocence. Upon its re-emergence, that sentiment is unchanged. And so this is how individual shots were treated within the films of the Soviet theorists. In The New Babylon by Grigory Kazinstev, he edits the suffering work of the underprivileged class alongside celebrations of people in The New Babylon. He prioritises in the composition fans and clothing and symbols that are all needed to re-emerge later to denote the idea of an oppressor. The Soviet filmmakers were to use this plasticity of cinema, its rhythm, its sound, its composition, and harvest the calculated balance of mise-en-scene to create an idea. And to expand on those ideas even further, it then became the aim to expand upon the Kuleshov effect. The Soviet shift in mentality towards the editing process can be pictured rather simply. Rather than viewing splices of film on a horizontal plane, it was instead envisioned on a vertical one. Shots were constructed or layered on top of one another, and Soviet montage theory saw that each cell of film has a definition, has a gesture, that when placed alongside another cell, that possesses a different meaning. There, arose the third meaning where the intellectual theory of montage arises. Now much of the study of Soviet montage theory has been simplified into categories that deal with differing practices to elicit a certain result. Metric montage deals with editing at a certain rhythm regardless of what's occurring on screen, so that there's an unwavering pace within the editing process. An example is in October. The shots are cut at the exact same length as one another to evoke meaning. Rhythmic montage was on the context of the shots, 
allowing for the pacing to shift in accordance with the action. Tonal and overtonal were primarily based on the content within the shots, referring to the synecdoche of a shot as a gesture for representing a certain emotional response. However, what we learn when studying the work of Soviet filmmakers is that though their work was calculated, the very basis of their theory was intellectual montage, a combination of all forms of editing tools. Because when we refer to the basis of Soviet montage, we're not just talking about a bunch of people that cared about cinema. Soviet montage was a byproduct of a revolution, and revolutions are rarely isolated solely within the realms of politics. Politics and aesthetics are inextricably intertwined, and the major artistic tenet of the Soviet Union was Soviet constructivism. That Soviet look, instantly recognisable, of posters with strong square fonts and geometric compositions, that is Soviet constructivism. A movement for the removal of any style that suggested ornamentation or the decorative, taking away any excess towards an industrial and pragmatic style of art. Because of how this ideology is so opposed to views of romanticism or surrealism, it pushed Soviet visual arts towards a primarily intellectual process in which the methodology of cinema became intertwined with the philosophy of the Communist Party. Soviet montage established that to discuss cinema, one must fuse philosophy with the act of making art. Thus began a discourse in the Soviet Union that art by its very nature is always in conflict. Conflict to the status quo, conflict for its social mission, and even conflict within its methodology. However, if there could be a synthesis between its methodology and the immaterial facet of the socialist regime, then the intellectual goals of Soviet constructivism would be achieved. Soviet montage was that synthesis. At the intersection of natural logic and industrial logic is the dialectic of the art form. This is the collision that occurs within montage, the collision of the psychological processes active within pieces of film that bring into existence the new philosophy of Soviet cinema. And to truly understand the depth of Soviet montage, one simply has to analyse the work. The Odessa step sequence from Battleship Potemkin is the poster child for the Soviet montage. Shots of inanimate objects become animated. The clutching of symbols and the growing power struggle between the proletariat and the domineering powers that be, all told through the interplay of gestures and the third meanings that arise between them. The gesture of the colour red this time, not one of lost hope, but of defiance. Looking to the work of other Soviet filmmakers of the time, we see in a film like Mother by Vsevolod Bodovkin, the climactic sequence in which the peasant mother hoists a flag in defiance of the trampling soldiers. Previously, we'd seen shots of a rushing torrent of water shattering the earth, demonstrating the power of the soldiers. However, now, edited alongside the resolute stature of the woman, the shots have transgressed their meaning to represent the martyrdom of the woman and a shift in power finally culminating in a shot of a flag waving high on the buildings of 20th century Russia. The flag, a gesture, re-emerging, bringing a synthesis between the common person and the revolution through montage. You can see the juxtaposition of ideas to create new ones omnipresent throughout the work of Soviet filmmakers. But that isn't to say that the style was completely uniform. Someone like Giga Vertov utilised montage for his own means, aiming to use the eye of the camera to capture a perspective of the world impossible to humans. In perhaps the greatest edited film of all time, Man with a Movie Camera, the aim is through speed and geometry to tell a story that with its sheer dynamism paints a new picture of the world we live in. But to see the entirety of Soviet montage as a new form of editing, 
misses the entire thesis of its practice. Soviet montage is based in the deep calculation of all mise-en-scene. Eisenstein, for example, blended music theory with his composition when editing a climactic scene of Alexander Nevsky. Every piece of the puzzle was necessary to create the discourse of cinema, and montage was the means of perfecting that discourse. Ultimately, the theory of montage is still in effect today, even if unconsciously, the tenets of the Kuleshov effect will always remain. The possibilities of what montage can elicit is the bedrock of all cinema. It's the tool that indicates how a piece of film is to be viewed. It's an ever-changing context. And all it takes is for one piece of film to be placed next to another, and the entire piece changes. All it takes is a single shot at the right place at the right time for a revolution to begin. We'd like to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. And with Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected, so you can create your own brand of a cinema viewing experience, available to stream anytime, anywhere. Right now on Mubi, you can watch The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, directed by Sophie Fiennes. A modern take on the feature video essay, philosopher Slavoj Žižek takes us through a cavalcade of cinema through a lens we've never seen before, taking your favourite directors and weaving a thread that may include sexual fantasy, Coca-Cola and Nazism, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology is as insightful as it is hilarious. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash cinemacartography. That's mubi.com slash cinemacartography for a whole month of great cinema for free.